evening and welcome to the Hedberg Public Library. Our speaker tonight is Jim Drager, an architectural historian and author of Filler Up, The Glory Days of Wisconsin Gas Stations. Two Janesville stations are included in the book, which was published last month by Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Mr. Drager's goal in writing and speaking about gas stations is finding suitable reuses for these historic structures. Copies of Filler Up will be available for sale and signing after the program. Please welcome Jim Drager. Thanks everybody for coming out. What I'd like to do today is just share a little bit of uh, my, uh, what I've learned from researching gas stations over the last few years. I've actually been working on the topic of gas stations for quite a long time. Uh, it's really been about 25 years that I've been interested in gas stations, although the more I knew, the more interested I got. It's like any topic in history, the deeper you dig, the more you become fascinated in it. So um, about three years ago, um, we started working hard on the book, uh, my co-author Mark Speltz and I. I apologize, Mark can't be here today. He uh, wanted to come along, but something came up at the last minute. He couldn't make it. So I'll forge on without him. But I really started getting interested about 25 years ago when I was doing work in the southeastern, or the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, we did architectural historical surveys, and we'd go to these little towns in South Carolina and Georgia and places like Bishopville and Gaffney and Andersonville. And uh, we'd take pictures of all the buildings over 50 years old in the town and write descriptions of them. And what I noticed from that work was that there were a lot of early gas stations just sitting completely vacant. They'd been uh, shut down. And I thought, geez, somebody ought to start taking pictures of those before they're all gone. So I just started taking photos of them at first and then started researching them later and got very interested in the topic enough that uh, I decided to uh, explore uh, doing a book on the subject, and here we are today. So um, I, I, in looking at gas stations, I think one of the things that people might first ask is, who in the heck would write a book about gas stations? <laughs> and I really, when I started writing and I thought, God, I sure hope somebody reads this book. Uh, but, you know, as I, as I worked on it, there were a couple things that really made me think that it was an interesting topic. One, I think ordinary buildings are important. Uh, ordinary buildings that are kind of the background buildings of our daily lives are important. As, they're as important as the monumental buildings because they help us understand who we are, where we came from, where we're going. Uh, and also, uh, I think gas stations in particular are important buildings. I've become quite convinced of that after doing a lot of research on them. Because uh, for one thing, the gas station is really one of the few buildings that everyone shares in common. You know, if you think about the places that every single person uses, there aren't very many of them. Uh, the grocery store, uh, that's about the only other one I can think of that everyone uses. So uh, gas stations are part of our shared communal experience, and I think learning more about them helps us understand what that experience of being Americans is about. And uh, I think gas stations are a wonderful way to uh, celebrate the transformations uh, of the country caused by the advent of the automobile. My basic premise in approaching the book is that buildings aren't just mere buildings. It's not just the architecture that's important about buildings. Buildings are really a way to look at culture in general and work, look at um, the values that people hold. Architecture is, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's created in a time and a place. So what fascinates me as an architectural historian is trying to explore the relationship between the buildings that people create and the effects that those buildings have on people. So they shape us and we shape them as well. 
and understanding that relationship is revealing of culture in general. So I really think of architecture as a building is, is more than just a building, it's a container, and that container st holds the stories of the past. And I think the reason why we want to preserve historic buildings is because it's a way to hang on to the things of the past. When you demolish a building, you really lose everything, all of the stories that relate that building to the world around you. you can, sure, they can be captured in the written, uh, in the printed word, or people may still have memories of them, but they're much more fleeting and a lot less tangible when there, there isn't the historic building that tells that story. So part of our motivation in writing the book was trying to encourage people that gas stations are important and that gas stations can be preserved and that gas stations tell important stories about the past. When you're researching a book, you're really hoping for accidents. Not necessarily literal, like the one on the uh, right-hand side, but, you know, uh, one of the great joys of doing research is coming across things that you just never expected. And one of those, it, these are a couple examples. The, the one on the uh, right-hand side is uh, an accident uh, that was photographed by a Madison photographer named McVicker. He was sent out by the newspaper to take a picture because the person uh, who was driving the car that you can see, uh, not the one that's overturned, but the other car, happened to be a famous Wisconsin figure. It was Frank Lloyd Wright. And that was Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, 1926 Cord Phaeton. A pretty expensive, exotic car for the time. And Wright was uh, driving, um, well, one of Wright's students was driving him uh, through Oregon in 1933. And he sideswiped a Choles floral delivery truck. And the truck spun out and ended up being pushed ahead of Wright's car. And Wright's car just turned it end over end over end over end and rolled it right up against the gas pumps there. And uh, one of the things that that points out is that gas, gas stations are dangerous places. And accidents do happen. And safety is always a concern. Uh, the other is a newspaper clipping that we found when we were looking for something else in the newspaper, and I thought it was just a delightful story. It's the story of a Cudahy, Wisconsin gas station owner named Harry Baumgarten. And Harry uh, uh, built a gas station, and uh, people don't probably know this today, but in the early days of highways, highways would change course in cities fairly frequently. As a street was improved, they'd move the highway from the lesser street in worse condition to the better street. So uh, Harry built his, his gas station along the highway, and then they rerouted the highway, and they moved it away from him. And all of a sudden, that great location he had wasn't so hot anymore. So he was a, he was a man uh, who took things into his own hands. So one night, he snuck out with a paintbrush, and he repainted all the highway markings to go from the old route of the highway all the way to a station. Really pretty smart idea. But, you know, like a lot of people who are uh, criminals, he didn't think it all the way through and he didn't bother to paint the signs going back to the highway from his station. So a guy showed up the next morning and got gas and he couldn't figure out how to get back to the highway and he smelled a rat, so he called the sheriff. And the sheriff came and found Harry and uh, grabbed him by the ear and said, uh, get busy with a brush, and made him repaint the highway markings. I think it's also a great story of law enforcement in the past, too, because you know, he didn't give him a ticket. He just made him fix his mistake. Early on, I realized that to understand gas stations, you have to remember that they're there to make money. They're for-profit businesses. So if you really want to understand what shapes gas stations and how they change over the time, it's really important to follow the money and figure out what money has to do with the decisions that people make. Uh, in the early days of selling gas, marketing was really not very sophisticated, and it was mostly left in the hands of the proprietors who ran the individual stations. They didn't even have, even the larger oil chains didn't have uh, 
good standardization of their signs. And when they bring the signs to the stations, people just lean them against the building or prop them up in the median. Or it wasn't very sophisticated. So uh, it left people to their own devices. And a lot of the gas stations in the early days were mom and pop businesses. They were startup businesses. So there were a lot of creative entrepreneurial people out there who had started gas stations. And they did all sorts of different things to try to attract business. And I've, I've clipped just a couple of uh, what I think are colorful examples of that creativity. The uh, image that we're looking at on the left-hand side is of a gas station in Ripon, Wisconsin. Uh, it was right in the downtown. By right in the downtown, I mean right in the middle of all the commercial buildings on Main Street. Uh, the gas pump that you see in the image is actually sitting, is per perched right at the curb. So you just pulled up on the edge of the street to get your gas at this location here. It was called a curbside pump. And uh, the uh, proprietor of the station standing there next to the gas pump, and next to him you see a little uh, oil can dog, made, dog made out of oil cans. And uh, just down from him was an oil can windmill, and a little farther down was an oil can figure. And o even over the top of the building, spelled out in giant oil can letters, was the name of the station, Hills Service Station. So it was kind of an oil can tour de force, and he used the oil can as a means of marketing his uh, station. On the right-hand side, we see another example of that oil can marketing. This is a uh, station in Madison, Wisconsin, Helixson Service Station, which sold Penco, which was a Madison-based uh, independent uh, brand. And they built a parade float for a parade with a miniature replica of the gas station done in oil cans on the back of uh, this truck. And uh, at, at an event a couple weeks ago, I met a guy who was on this float in 1933. And he told me that as they were driving down the street, the oil cans were falling off of the building onto the kids that were sitting on the parade floats. It won the first prize for the parade that year, too. In understanding how gas stations, why the gas stations look the way they do, it's also important to understand that culture shapes the way that we see architecture and that we build things uh, in certain ways because they connect to larger cultural ideas. And here are a couple of uh, examples of that phenomenon. Uh, you can see they're both pretty exotic, flamboyant looking buildings. And you, you may wonder, you know, why did people pick really exotic looking forms for the gas stations? Well, part of it is there was no architectural precursor for the gas station. There, was, there wasn't anything that did what a gas station does before. Probably the closest thing was the community horse watering trough in the pre-auto age. So there weren't preconceived notions among people about what would be correct for gas stations. And that meant that architects could make them look like anything they wanted. The, I think these buildings really celebrate the changes that happened as a result of the automobile. The, in the 19th century, most people never went 30 miles from the place they were born in their entire life. It was 30 miles. In the early 20th century, when, once the car came on the scene, you could do that in a Sunday drive. So it expanded the world to people greatly. And so architects were trying to find a way to embody that, that new spirit of adventure. So they picked imagery for their stations that connected with people's love of travel and sense of exotica and sense of adventure. So both of these stations are meant to appeal to that. And the imagery for this is really taken out of popular culture, uh, movies of the time, books, uh, world's fairs things like that, that expose people to broader culture. The uh, building on the left-hand side was a teepee, concrete teepee station, which sat Wyowego, Wisconsin. The building on the right-hand side is a Wadhams station that sat at 27th and Wisconsin Avenue in Milwaukee. This is my favorite of all the Wadhams designs. The Wadhams was a, a, an independent chain operated out of Milwaukee, 
And in 1915, they were looking for an image for their stations. They wanted to make all the stations look, have a similar kind of appeal. And so they went to an architect from Milwaukee named Alexander Eschweiler, who was the leading architect of Milwaukee at that time. He was the status society architect. He designed homes for all the very rich and famous Milwaukee people, like Harley of Harley Davidson. Uh, so it's interesting that they went to this elite architect to design something as simple as a gas station. But he did, came up with this pagoda design, and I think his design was really visionary. And the, what was so interesting about it was he understood that gas stations had to be functional. So at the bottom of his design is a, just a glass box. It's just simply a very simple building with lots and lots of windows running all the way around. So it's, you can see everywhere uh, on the site. And on top of it, he added this tremendously flamboyant pagoda roof, uh, which was meant to capture the imagination of motorists as they came by. And he wanted his buildings not to look like any other gas stations, so people would really see them and remember them. And I think the brilliant stroke uh, that Wadhams had in wanting to look these, make these stations all look alike is they understood that people were loyal to their local station. You know, this is the days of full service where people had a neighborhood gas station and the gas station owner knew you by name, knew the names of your kids, knew what school they went to, what sports they were in, and he knew all the gossip from town too, so you could find out what was going on by talking to him. And uh, people were loyal, not to the brand, but to the person. And so Wadhams was thinking, well, how do we take that loyalty that they have to that individual and transfer it to the corporation? Well, you do that by making all the stations look similar so that when someone's driving in another part of town or in another city and they see another Wadham station, they say, hey, honey, there's a Wadham station just like Joe's. Why don't we go there? So it was a marketing ploy to make all of these look alike. My favorite thing about this particular station is the airplane, which was motorized, and it, it flew around the circles around the top of the building when it was open. Social trends also informed the way gas stations looked. I think one of the most fascinating things that I learned in researching gas stations is the role that women played in shaping the way gas stations look. In part, gas stations began looking like these, these uh, domestic looking stations like houses uh, because of the encroachment of gas stations into neighborhoods. In the 1920s, when gas stations begin to be built in big numbers, they start building them on the, on the big streets in town, the wide streets, which were until that time, the kind of premier residential districts. They tear down a house and they put a station up. And in the early days, gas stations were just wooden and tin slapped together shacks, and they were ugly and smelly and dirty and dangerous. And people didn't want them in their neighborhoods. So uh, the, the, the genius that gas station designers had was to understand that if they were building in these residential neighborhoods, they'd get a lot pu less pushback from people if they made them look like houses. So they made them look like the houses of the in the neighborhoods that they were building them in so that they fit in better. And it also, people would be much less likely to criticize something that looked like their own house. Uh, so uh, it was a way to appease the, the uh, concern that people had. But women played a significant role in it because women were major customers of gas stations, uh, especially in the 1920s. In the teens and 20s, the wealthy owned cars. It wasn't a middle class thing. It wasn't a working class thing. It was purely a plaything of the rich. And uh, although men bought cars, women drew, drove cars. And there were a lot of women who were stay-at-home wives who had a lot of leisure time on their hands and would go out and drive. And the gas station owners understood that they were a significant part of the market by the mid-1920s. They started writing about it in their literature and talking about it. And you can see it architecturally in the stations. And one, one of the things I want to point out to you that shows that is 
uh, and the station that we're looking at on the left-hand side, there's a little door around the side of the station. That's the ladies' restroom. And the ladies' restrooms, beginning in the 1920s, were always located on the side of the building, around the corner. And that was a recognition that the gas station space itself was really a man space. The interior was a masculine space. So rather than make women go through the man space to get to the restroom, they tucked it around the side. And they often embellished it quite a bit. You could see ladies' rooms that had statuary niches on the sides and garden gates to go through them and elaborate landscape paths that would lead you to them, light fixtures over the tops of the doors as well. Uh, but they, they understood that these women were also very affluent women, and they had expectations about the kind of service they would get and, the kind of, uh, and what gas stations would be like for them. And the station on the right-hand side illustrates that. That station was located on State Street in Madison. And it, in a contest, uh, in a national contest, it was voted the second most beautiful gas station in America. And it was really quite a sight. There were uh, rocks with lights uh, hidden underneath them that illuminated at night. Uh, you can see it has very elaborate roof, castle-like appearance. And uh, it was also really outfitted to appeal to these upper middle class people by uh, making it look like the kinds of houses that were popular among that class in, in suburbia. Beyond that, they also tried to attract women by placing amenities in the stations that would appeal to them. Uh, a station like that, perhaps a third to a half of that gas station was devoted just to women. Uh, the, restrooms of these early stations had very elaborate powder puff rooms that were, uh, so you'd walk into the, the woman would walk into the powder puff room and it would be like a ladies lounge inside of the station and then the restroom space was off of that. And they got quite elaborate with tile floors, Persian rugs, uh, oil paintings on the walls. Ladies, you keep in notes so you can talk to your uh, local station attendant. Uh, they had um, wicker furniture. They were uh, potted plants. They were very elaborately laid out because they wanted women to feel comfortable when they were in the stations. And a lot of women at that time were already traveling cross country. They needed places to stop. There weren't rest stops like there are today. It also gave them a place to go when they were having their cars serviced. They could go hang out in that space there. And the man, the man space uh, was the uh, operator, uh, the opera attendance room, and then the men's bathroom was off of the operator's room, and they shared the same restroom with the mechanics. So, you know, he's doing your grease job and comes in and washes up in the sink and uh, leaves you a nice greasy sink uh, behind, and that was okay with the guys. They, would, they were willing to accept that, but that wouldn't work for women. Institutions played an important role in shaping the way gas stations looked as well. Uh, local institutions, city governments, uh, regulated the construction of gas stations through building permits, and uh, the state regulated them as well. Uh, in 1931, a state agency called the Wisconsin Industrial Commission had its powers extended to uh, regulate gas stations. Uh, before that, it regulated all buildings that had health and safety issues surrounding them that were sort of public buildings. So they reviewed all the plans for schools and factories and uh, city halls, fire stations, uh, um, uh, park uh, um, grandstands, all of those kinds of things. But their powers were extended to gas stations in 1931 because there were safety issues surrounding gas stations that were rather significant. And I ran across these pictures in the Wisconsin Historical Society archive collection when I was doing research for the book. And I thought, ooh, this something really interesting happened here. And they were taken by that, fo that photographer I mentioned before named um, Angus McVicker. And he kept a photo log of all his photos so we knew the exact date that this photo had been taken on. So we went into the Wisconsin State Journal newspapers and looked up the story, and lo and behold, there was a fantastic story involving what happened here. 
And the Wisconsin State Journal printed an eyewitness account of what had happened. The man had parked his car across the street, gotten out and turned around just in time to see everything that happened here. And uh, he, the, he told a fantastic story in the paper, which made for great reading. But what had happened was uh, this, this um, station's uh, attendant was standing next to the uh, building and he was talking to his brother and uh, the station blew sky high. The roof blew up in the air, the walls exploded out, covered the two of them in rubble. The uh, area where the pump island was, was picked up, uh, pieces of concrete that were 10 feet by 20 feet were picked up about 20 feet in the air and flipped upside down. And uh, a man was walking down the sidewalk in front of the station. He was blown out into the street by the force of the explosion. So it was just a catastrophic explosion. After it happened, uh, well, I should say that they were not hurt. The attendant and his brother were hospitalized for minor cuts and contusions, but they survived. And uh, the Wisconsin Industrial Commission went out the next day and started investigating the cause of it. And what they determined was uh, the station was built on the site of a house. They demolished a building and built the house there that filled the uh, basement excavation with gravel and built the station. And vapors from the gas tanks seeped into the gravel. And then there was a short in the wires that ran underground between the station and the pumps. And as soon as that short happened, it sparked all of that gas vapor and blew it sky high. And even more remarkably, that was the second gas station explosion that year in Madison. So it tells you why the government got involved in regulating gas stations. But by doing that, they also made gas stations more like each other by enforcing uniform standards and construction and layout and design that made uh, gas stations much more similar to each other. Corporations also played a major role in, in um, determining what gas stations looked like. I, before I told the story of the Wadhams chain and their uh, search for an image for their stations. Well, in 1928, an architect for the Pure Oil Company called Carl Peterson uh, came up with a standard design for all Pure Oil stations. Pure Oil wanted to make every station look just like the other ones so that they could have a unified image for their chain. And so he came up with this design. It's the only uh, gas station design that was patented. There was a US patent taken out on this design. And he came up with this house type design, which we've seen before, uh, with a you know bay window, a little round cottage door, uh, flower boxes, chimneys, chimney pots on the roof, uh, very domestic looking station design. And uh, the genius of his design was uh, this, this is kind of the, one of the smaller versions, and if you want to have a bigger one, you just added more chunks to it. You added wings to the building to make it larger, so they could scale it to any site, but they all looked alike. And the, but the real <clears throat> genius of Carl Peterson was that he saw the gas station as not being just merely a building, but also being related to the marketing efforts of the gas station chain. So he came up with this blue and white color logo, and he extended the color scheme to, and the design of this to everything that the gas station did. The road maps, the uh, matchbooks, the gas uh, globes on top of the gas pumps, uh, even the corporate stationery, all had a similar look to them and a similar color scheme. And that's really the beginnings of corporate branding. Uh, in, in this pure oil station. So when you see that Nike swoosh today and you think about how powerful that is in a, as an icon, it really got its start with uh, the pure oil chain. So how do we get from having these cute little cottage house stations to having stations that, that uh, look like this? Well, the answer is science. And there's a remarkable transformation that happens in the Great Depression. And it has its origins in the application of scientific business methods to gas retailing. 
they wanted to make stations as profitable as possible. So they started really trying to quantify what makes a station profitable. And kind of the Rosetta Stone of understanding this is a, is a, a treatise on gas station design that was done by an architect named K. Lomberg Holm in 1931 for a professional architect's magazine. He did the definitive work on, on gas stations. And what he did was he went to the major oil companies and he got them to open up their books to him and let him look at the profitability of individual stations. And he compared them and, and determined which ones were most profitable. And then he went out and examined those stations, tried to determine what is it about the design of that station that makes it profitable. And then he distilled all this into a report on gas station design that was quite comprehensive. He looked at literally everything about how gas stations worked. He looked at the locations of gas stations. At a four-corner intersection, which one is the most profitable? There is a more profitable corner. And it also depends on whether it has a stop sign at the intersection or a stop light. But he laid all that out. He looked at how big the lot should be, how far back on the lot the gas station should sit. He looked at things related to the color scheme of the station. He determined that a white station with red lettering is the most visible gas station. Uh, and this is Parman Station in Madison down in the corner there that, that used that white, uh, red and white color scheme. He looked at how far away is the pump island. You want it close enough that the people who operate the station can be out on the curb standing ready when people come to a halt, but not so close that it makes it feel squeezed or too tight when people want to pull their cars in. He looked at how big the letters are on the signs. How far away can a letter that's three inches tall be seen? How about five inches, seven inches, 11 inches? He laid that all out in tables so people could figure out how big to make the signs. He looked at where you should light the station at night. Uh, he even looked at where the air hoses should be. What's the best place to put an air hose on your lot? And he quantified all of this stuff. And the inescapable conclusion of his report is that one particular type of station was a lot more profitable than others. And that's what we call the box type station, which we're looking at right there. The box type station, as a matter of fact, is so profitable and so efficient in full service gas retailing that it emerges on the scene about 1930 by about 1935, almost no stations are being built anywhere that aren't box-type stations, and they continue to build them as long as full-service gasoline state, uh, it is uh, a marketing uh, device. They, in the 60s, they put ranch house roofs on them. In the 70s, they put mansard roofs around them. But essentially, you strip that away, and you have a box-type station. And it survives because it works because it works better, it's more efficient, and it's more profitable than any other design. And that's why it sweeps away all of the house-type stations before it. If gas station owners had a motto about gas stations, it would probably be quicker, cheaper, stronger. They were always looking to innovate in the construction of stations to try to find out ways to make them cheaper and to make them better. Because as chains were expanding and they're trying to build territory, they have money tied up in every building in their chain. So the cheaper they can build those buildings and still have them be functional and working, uh, the more stations that they can put up. And gas stations take a lot hard beating. They're a building that gets abused. So they had to build them pretty stoutly in order for them to survive. And we tell the story in our book of a couple of Wisconsin firms that specialized in gas station design. And we're looking at a couple of their stations here. Uh, the building on the right-hand side was built by a company called Trocti based out of Madison. And if you've ever driven around in Madison, you've seen all those odd little metal buildings uh, all over Madison, built by the Tracti Company. Well, Tracti's started out building horse troughs. They patented a corrugating, a metal corrugating machine that they could take sheets of metal and run it through, and it would rib the metal so it would be stronger. And then they'd roll the metal around and make a horse trough out of it. Well, in 1919, one of the bo brothers buys a Dodge car, 
And he gets the idea of taking those horse trough panels and standing them up on end and bolting them into a metal frame and just adding them on and making a car garage, put trusses over the top and then bend a sheet over the top for the roof and he builds himself a car garage. It was blown down in a windstorm a couple days later, but he was not deterred. <laughs> he put it back up again and uh, he was approached pretty soon by other people that said, hey, can you build one for me? Can you build one for me? And, he, and they ended up leaving the horse trough business and getting into the prefabricated building business just as gas stations start to boom. And uh, they find a market in gas stations because their construction is modular. They can make it a, the building any size. They can just add on other panels to it to make it longer or wider, to make it any size that, that people wanted. And the building on the right-hand side is the Midway Oil Company in Prairie du Chien, which is still a full-service station, by the way. And they built the, uh, a filling station there uh, using one of Tracti's buildings. And then about 10 years later, they had Tracti come back and add a service bay to it. So you could add on to it as well. The building on the left-hand side was made by a company called Steel King. And uh, I was another one of my odd little accidents in writing the book was I discovered that Steel King is still in business today. And uh, they were once located in Milwaukee, but they are now in Waupun. And uh, so I wrote them an email and said, I'm writing this book on gas stations. and I was wondering what you might have that might help me. And boy, they were generous. And they let me uh, come to their company. And they dug out all the old papers and uh, old historic images and let, let us really pour through all of it. And they had a remarkable story, too. It was founded by a man named Walter Junkerman. And Walter Junkerman, I'm convinced, saw the Tracti gas stations and said, oh, what an interesting idea, because his early gas stations look almost exactly like Tracti's. And uh, he starts making money and decides that gas station construction is a specialty that he can work in exclusively. So he doesn't design anything other than gas stations. And he keeps perfecting his craft and building his business. And by the 1950s, his company becomes one of the largest uh, builders of gas stations in the country. They're building about 100 gas stations a year all across the country for all the major oil companies, Texaco, Shell, uh, and... Uh, it partly it tells you that gas stations were a highly sophisticated building. We see them as being kind of ordinary, but gas stations really were very sophisticated architecture. You had to have architects and engineers design them. One of the most revealing things to me when was um, we went into the files of the Wisconsin Industrial Commission, which are at the Wisconsin Historical Society now, looking for all the gas stations that we're going to feature in the book. And we found out that almost all of them were designed by architects. And we never expected that. And I really believe they were designed by architects because there were so many health and safety issues and so many engineering aspects of, of designing gas stations that really required the attention of an architect. Uh, you can see that that building that they're building there on the left-hand side is a full steel frame building. Steel King got out of the business of building gas stations, by the way, once uh, Phil Service went away. But they stayed, uh, they found a new niche in the business, and they make uh, gas station canopies now. So when you go to your full service station, there's that big canopy hanging over your head. It could be a Steel King canopy. They're one of about a dozen companies in the country that do that. The uh, most constant uh, theme about gas stations is change. Gas stations are ever changing. They're among the most changeable of all buildings. Almost every gas station ever built has already been destroyed. They mostly have, are gone. There were thousands of gas stations across the country. Madison in 1928 had 215 gas stations, and virtually none of those exist. Just a handful of them exist today, and they're almost unrecognizable, every one of them. Uh, so it tells you that gas stations uh, are, are ephemeral. Most gas stations have a useful life of about 10 to 15 years, and at the end of that time, they're demolished, altered, uh, a new gas station's built on the, the site, or it's just converted to a different use. So um, 
obsolescence is a big part of the history of gas stations. You've got to keep changing all the time and innovating or you're go going to become obsolete. There, there was a lot, there's never been a lot of money in gas retailing. The profit margins are fairly thin. So if you're not keeping up with the latest trends, you can better bet that your competitor down the street is and they're going to force you out of business if you don't change. One of the big questions I had when I was researching gas stations was, how do we move from full service to self-service and why in the world did that happen so fast? Because full service lasted for a very long time. The, the whole economics of gas stations was built on the full service model, which emerges in the mid-1920s. And uh, the, the notion is uh, provide all auto repairs and provide pump gas, check oil, wash windows, provide full service at the stations. And it, it, indeed, it's a very profitable package for gas stations until the 1970s. And uh, tracing the story of what happened there was quite fascinating, and it, it's an amazing story. Uh, gas stations, in, beginning in the late 1960s, gas stations start facing new competition from quarters that they never had competition on before. Competition comes from uh, what the trade industry called high-volume pumpers. High volume pumpers were gas stations that had more than one pump island. Instead of having two or three pumps on an island, they may have three or four or five or six pump islands, all with pumps. And the, the way they affect the uh, regular gas stations is it allowed them to shave the profit margins thinner because they made up the profit in volume so they could undercut the prices of the mom and pop stations, the smaller ones. So uh, all of a sudden they're having p price pressures pushed on them on that side. On the repair side of the business, there, there are many different specialty repair places that emerge. Oil change places, uh, muffler uh, shops, um, the, the, all of the uh, places that did specialty repairs like um, uh, tire centers. All of those places come and they take out the most profitable repairs out of the gas station. Gas stations had to have trained mechanics on staff to do these repairs, and cars are becoming more and more complex. You're getting uh, fuel-injected cars, electronic ignitions, and these guys have to be trained to uh, repair this. You need expensive diagnostic equipment, and you need a lot of repairs coming in the door to do that. And with these specialty places coming in, they steal out all the bread and butter work, and the gas stations are left with the very expensive, time-consuming repairs that are not as profitable as the other repairs they were doing. So they get squeezed on the service side, too. At the very same time, self-service emerges. Self-service really gets its start in um, Texas with the 7-Eleven company. They have a chain of convenience stores, and these... There's an independent oil jobber that recognizes that they've got these big parking lots and they got people in the buildings and they're taking money and that if you could convince them to put pumps in the ground and pay them a percentage of the take, he could get free labor and sell gas. So he goes to 7-Eleven Company and convinces them to do an experiment on seven or eight of their stations in Texas. And 7-Eleven's taking all the money, right? So they get to look at the books and they're seeing what's coming through and they went, ooh, there's a lot of money coming through here. And so they cut that guy out and they go it alone and they expand uh, self-service gas stations to the 7-Eleven chain in general and the convenience store slash gas station is born. All of this stuff happens just as the OPEC oil embargo comes about. Gas prices skyrocket. There's a lot of intense pressure on the prices. There are price wars. There are shortages of gasoline. And all of it's just a perfect storm. And it just completely turns the industry upside down almost overnight. One of the remarkable statistics is in 1968, there were almost no self-service stations, barely enough to, call, to count. By 1975, 85% of all gas stations are self-service. So in the short distance of eight years, the whole industry is just completely upended, and what was once profitable is no longer profitable.
and the new model becomes convenience store with attached gas station. This is the most recent gas station that we put in the book. It was finished about three years ago. Uh, it has a steel king canopy, I found out later after the book went to press. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about this station, the reason why we put it in the book, is it reflected the, the, the uh, power that communities have to shape the way things that look in their communities. There had been a mobile station here, and they wanted to expand and add more pumps. And Mequon said, sure, we'd love to have you do that, but you better make the station look the way we want it to look to fit into our community. So they built a brick station with a lot of ornamental brickwork. We're looking actually towards the back side of the station. The front side is landscaped. It has a pond. It has plantings. It, has, uh, it's, it looks like a little kind of uh, cottage from the uh, street side. And then back behind is, uh, are all the gas pumps. Uh, in case you think gas stations make a lot of money on gas, this guy said in an interview that he makes more money on bottled water than he does on gasoline. So the profits continue to be thin for the operators of gas stations. The money's all going somewhere else. So what becomes of historic gas stations? Well, a lot of them close up their doors and go. They just can't keep up with the competition. This is Billy Schnabel, who owned the uh, Wadhams gas station in Cedarburg. And when it came time for Billy to uh, retire, he tried to find somebody else to buy the station. He couldn't find any buyers. So he just locked the door and left it. Uh, and his daughter, uh, Kay, ended up owning the station. She still owns it today. It's a jewelry shop. But he just, he, like many other small places, he just closed up. Even the major oil companies had tremendous problems because of the changes in the industry. The oil companies saw, found themselves sitting on uh, thousands and thousands of outdated, outmoded gas stations that once were profitable and no longer were. And so they left them by the droves. They just abandoned them uh, in cities, boarded them up, and walked away. This is a station in Wauwatosa that we photographed in 1981. And this was the face of many cities in the 70s and 80s as uh, we made this transition from full service to self-service. These stations were abandoned in large numbers. And uh, there were tremendous problems for the cities because they uh, didn't know what to do with the locations. There were so many of them, it was very difficult to deal with. And one of the things that came to light as these stations were abandoned and people began trying to reuse them is that there was a, a tremendous environmental problem lurking underground that leaking tanks had gotten into the ground uh, below these stations and contaminated the soils. And so the government stepped in and they uh, created uh, new restrictions for gas stations. Uh, they now have to have monitoring equipment in the ground to detect leaks. They have to have modern tanks. You have to replace your tanks on certain schedules. And you have to buy very expensive liability insurance uh, to pay for uh, soil contamination. But that we were stuck with the problem with all of these existing stations. And it made them almost unusable un, uh, because the banks were scared to death to lend money on them. It wasn't until Brownfield legislation that created grants to remediate these sites that the sites became uh, bankable and people could get loans on gas station sites and uh, redevelop them and use them for other things. The cities responded by trying to uh, pass moratoriums on construction of gas stations, trying to force companies to use the old stations, or uh, some cities, uh, if you had, a, a say, a mobile station and wanted to build a new mobile station on the edge of town, you had to demolish an existing mobile station in town first to try to get rid of the vacant stations that were on uh, in stock. Gas stations are still demolished even today, and even ones that are in great repair. This is one that we featured in the book. It's Clipple's service station. Uh, it's just south of Hayward on Highway 151. And as you can see, it was in marvelous repair when we, uh, when we uh, photographed it. And um, it had been built as a gas station in the 1930s, meaning to, 
meant to appeal to people who are traveling down the road. Uh, and it was a gas station for quite a long time, and then it became a six-stool bar for a while. And uh, then later it became a, a, an office uh, for a company. And uh, we, we went out and filmed at this place uh, for the uh, companion documentary that we did for Wisconsin Public Television. And uh, I drove by about three months later, it was gone. The owner never said anything about what they were planning to do. They demolished the building to build a rustic home furniture store. So they built a fake log building behind this, back along the tree line, to sell log furniture. And this building, uh, where this building once sat, is just part of the parking lot. And I thought, eh, what a short-sighted move this was, because they could have just furnished this as a little rustic log cabin with their furniture and just really played this up as an asset, but they uh, instead demolished it. It's not all gloom and doom, though. There are success stories out there, too, and we should celebrate some of those in the book. This is my favorite of all. Uh, this is the Copeland Service Station uh, in Milwaukee. This service station was uh, built in 1937 for the Copeland family. It was built by a Milwaukee architect who has the best architect name I've ever heard. Are you ready for this? His name was Urban Peacock. <laughs> what a great name, and he designed movie theaters, better yet. So, you know, think work was probably getting a little slim for him in 1937, and he picked up the design for this station and did this nice little streamlined design. It was run by the Copeland family for uh, a few generations, and then uh, when everything fell apart, uh, the Copelands got out of the business and sold it off, and a couple of owners owned it over time, and then the last guy that got it was kind of a shady character, and he left the station, just uh, ran away from it, and left it uh, abandoned and uh, with soil contamination underneath. And the city of Milwaukee decided that they were going to tear the building down. They, they got ownership of it through back, back taxes. They decided to just clear the site. It became a poster child for bad buildings in Milwaukee. It was actually a photo of this was in an aldermanic newsletter with a headline, Help Rid Your Community of Eyesores. And the article was about, if you see buildings that look like this, you should call the city and we will condemn them and demolish them. So it slunk about as low as any building could possibly go. But the people who lived in the neighborhood were really fond of this station. They remembered it being a community center in the neighborhood, and they wanted it to be a community center again. So they got organized, and they uh, found a person willing to redevelop the building, uh, Bob Olin, and he turned it into a, ga uh, into a coffee shop. Uh, Bob's dad was a gas station owner and owned a station that looked much like this. And inside of the building, he has his dad's uh, gas station operator name sign from the old gas station on the wall, which I think is kind of neat. Um, but Bob uh, used the historic preservation tax credits uh, to help fund it. He got the, um, um, the uh, back taxes forgiven, and he got a brownfield grant site to... Uh, uh, Brownfield grant to clean up the contaminated site. And then he just did a beautiful job of converting this to a coffee shop. And what I love about it so much is he changed it, but he, killed, step, he kept its gas station ness. Uh, the service bay doors that you see there, they're not really doors anymore. They're just windows that look like doors, but it keeps that flavor of the gas station. Uh, where it used to say greasing and washing over the top of those bays, it now says coffee and cappuccino. And the, even the sign itself is based on the kind of iconography that they used on gas station signs. It looked gas station sign-like. And the name of it, Sherman Perk, is a play on words of the neighborhood that it belongs in Sherman Park. And uh, the people at Sherman Park are just delighted with this now, and it's a uh, a very uh, busy and uh, well-liked uh, center of the, the uh, society again. Here's another one of my favorite little gas station stories. This one was a late discovery. Just accidentally got in the book by the skin of its teeth. I had to stay overnight in, in La Crosse and get up very, very early in the morning to get to Eau Claire. And independence is on the way between those two points. And I'm driving along, 
I'm going to do some interviews. I'm on a pretty tight schedule. I've got no time to spare at all. And I drive through Independence, and I see this station, and I thought, oh, my God, I, I can't stop. I don't have enough time. And I thought, I've got to stop. I have to stop and at least take some pictures because this is definitely going in the book. So it's quarter to seven in the morning. I stop and take some pictures. The service bay is open, and the guy's already in there working. So I drag him out from under a car so I can get his business card because I'm going to need to get in touch with him. And he tells me this great story about how he came to get this station. It's owned by a guy named Lauren Nelson. And Lauren was um, uh, a type A person. He owned three gas stations, a junkyard, and he ran an internet business at night. So he was a busy, busy guy. He had a brain aneurysm and almost died. They operated on him and saved his life. And the doctor said, you can never work again. And Lauren said, well, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who just going to sit on my hands. So I decided I would do the thing in my life that I love the most. So he bought this 1927 Texaco station. He restored it, and he serviced his cars in here. And he told me, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I can think about is getting to work. I can't wait to get to work in the morning because I love what I do. And I thought, boy, Lauren, if you can put that in a bottle and, <laughs> and sell it, what a great place the world would be. So he stripped off the old banjo sign. It was still there yet and covered with uh, many coats of paint from all the businesses that had been in there. And the old porcelain Texaco sign was still underneath. He put vintage signage back on the station. His wife bought him the gas pumps as an anniversary present. So ladies, nothing says love more than a set of vintage gas pumps. He said it's great fun because people pull up at the gas pumps all the time thinking they can get gas and they look at the price on the pump and then they just sit there for a minute and then they sort of sheepishly drive slowly off. Uh, as a consequence of being in the documentary and being in the book, he's now become famous. He has tour buses come by twice a day and he gets on the bus and talks to him about his station. So he's now a gas station celebrity. Oh, goody, here's the time where you get to talk. So if people have questions or comments or stories, I'd be happy to entertain those now. So it lived amazing me, and he actually, where we lived, was a restored gas station. And our garage actually still has a pump on it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. It was the store actually became the house. Okay. Uh, uh, he lived in a, an old um, gas station and um, in Mesa Maney that had been converted into a house. And that, you know, the, the funny thing is people ask, have asked me that a number of times if I'm going out to, to talk about the book, if people use gas stations as houses. And indeed they do. There are quite a few of them that have been converted. And also uh, the gas stations were historically built with houses uh, as part of the stations too. It was not uncommon at all in the 1920s to have the uh, operators living above the building itself. Uh, in the second story. Because running a gas station was a busy job. It was pretty much a 24-7 kind of job. In the documentary, uh, we interview a gas station owner from here in Janesville, Bob Hedgecock, about uh, his station. And he talks about the long hours that he spent at the station, which generally started about 5.30 in the morning when he got up and uh, collected night crawlers for uh, to sell for bait and ended at about 10.30 uh, at night. So the days were very long and the work was very tough. Sure, the question is, uh, to, to save gas stations, you have to find a use for them. Uh, what kinds of uses have we seen for gas stations? Uh, there are gas stations that have been turned into custard shops. There are quite a number of, of those. Uh, Madison has a whole chain of custard shops built on old gas stations. Uh, they, mix, they make great coffee shops. The uh, guy who owns the Sherman Perk uh, has actually opened a second uh, uh, coffee shop in another gas station in Milwaukee. Um, th they are frequently used for restaurants. I've seen quite a few of those uh, as well. Uh, floral shops, 
they're, they're really good for any kind of small business. The advantage is you've got a lot of parking off street right there. Uh, and the buildings are essentially big, wide open spaces. So they are uh, very f easy to convert to new uses as well. Anybody else? Where are the two stations in Janesville? Ah, the two stations in Janesville. Oh, you Janesvillians better help me out with this. Uh, one of them is on, uh, is right next to the police station downtown. Uh, it was uh, built as a super service station. Uh, and the second one is on S Center, on South Center Avenue. And it's right next to a BP station. And the BP station was built to mirror the historic station. That's my favorite thing about going there is you can see how they frame the roof and the entrance and the little, uh, the little round opening where the clock was to look like the two of them. So if you stand by the little station and you look towards the convenience station, the, the similarities are striking. Oh boy. <laughs> I think you got me on that one. The question was, what brand did that little station sell? And I, frankly, I just can't remember what the brand was on that one. But it's in the book. Look it up. It was a Sinclair. Yeah, it was a Sinclair at one time. I'm not sure if it was built as a Sinclair or not. I can't remember that. There's a great story about that station in the documentary where uh, Bob Hedgecock talks about the day he closed the station and how a woman came and she cried and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea what to do now that you're closing. And he said uh, that she stayed at the pumps and cried for about a half an hour and then he suggested to her that she could go to the station that was six blocks farther up the road. <laughs> but it tells you how attached people were to gas stations. The one thing that's really changed about, ga about the way we buy gas today is it's no longer a personal intimate experience anymore. Especially with pay at the pump, it's a faceless, uh, it's a faceless transaction. We lose that whole social sphere that was once connected with gas stations. We've got great stories in the book about uh, the way that people talk about gas stations of the past. One of my favorites was a station in Manitowoc where uh, all of the uh, boys from school would parade into the station in the morning and hand over their neckties and the station owner would keep them in a locker in the station, and then at night they'd all come back and pick their neckties up and to go back home. So their parents thought they were wearing their ties to school. Yes, way in the back. Sure. The the question is, do you have any comments on the on the Clark? Uh, Super 100 stations. Yeah, uh, we write quite a bit about Emory Clark in the book. Uh, he's got a fascinating story. Uh, Emory Clark was a contractor in the Depression, and uh, he built a gas station for a guy, and the guy couldn't pay him. The things went bad, and he didn't have the money to pay for it. So Emory was stuck with the building, so he decided to operate the station himself, and he opened it up and started working there, and uh, he went to his wife and he said, you know, I can't decide whether I should go into the gas business or whether I should be a florist. And his wife said, honey, I think there's a lot more money in gas. And boy, was she right. He expanded out from that station, single station to a chain of stations. And he, he had an interesting market niche. He uh, only sold one grade of gasoline at his station. He only sold premium gas. And that meant that he only had a one tank in the ground, and he only had to have one pump. And so it, sim it simplified the startup costs, and it simplified operations in general uh, for a station. And uh, he became quite successful. He ended up um, buying an oil refinery in Chicago and eventually another one in Texas. And he became the largest independent oil company in the Midwest and had a, a chain uh, at its peak that had uh, about 1,500 uh, gas stations. And then uh, when the uh, whole convenience store uh, changeover happened, 
uh, at that point, he decided to sell out. He was pretty elderly, and he sold out of the business and sold off to a bigger company. That company uh, held was a holding company that owned a number of chains of gas stations, and they ended up selling out to yet a bigger holding company that owned even more gas stations. And eventually, uh, they just sold the brand completely out and closed all the Clark stations. And then someone bought the Clark name a couple of years ago. And so the Clark stations that ha are Clark stations today are owned by a, a, another entity that just bought the name as a marketing name. Good, good question. <laughs> Yeah, okay, great, great, great question. Uh, the question is, um, how did you go about picking the stations and gathering uh, your information? And uh, how did you choose what's going in the book? And are you planning on writing another book? And <laughs> et cetera. Uh, well, um, when we uh, put the book together, we um, decided to profile individual stations and tell their stories. So we looked at probably about 300 existing gas stations uh, that were still standing buildings. And from that 300, we tried to select them geographically. So we picked a good mix that covered the state. We tried to pick different types of stations so we could tell that broader story of how stations changed over time. And uh, we tried to pick stations that, some stations that had good stories to tell about the success of being able to retain stations so we could tell a message of, of preservation as well. And we ended up with a list of 59 stations that are featured in the back of the book. They each have a two-page spread that talks about them. Um, the documentary was developed at the same time. It actually started after the book was, in, uh, was underway, but documentaries are much quicker to produce than books, so it actually came out a year ago. And uh, it, it the content is overlapping, uh, but uh, not identical. We tell stories in the documentary that we don't tell in the book and vice versa, but all the stations that we talk about are the same stations. So they're nice companion pieces. One tells one part of a story, the other tells another part of the story. Um, so they're not, they're not meaning to, over, to overlap. Um, one of the things that we've done to uh, sense the book has been in print, is we started a gas station blog on the internet. Uh, it's called Foolish Thoughts. And you can find it by just Googling Foolish Thoughts in Wisconsin, and you'll get it right at the top of the hits. And what we're doing in, in that blog is we're sharing stories that people are still sharing with us about gas stations. When I go to these places, people tell me stories, and they show me pictures of their gas stations that are related to their families and that kind of thing. And we post all that content up there and we tell little behind the scenes stories about the book and how it came together. And we're just trying to continue uh, to update that all the time. So we continue to gather information. Whether there's another book, gas station book in the cards, I can't really say that yet. Um, I think that depends on what, how many people buy this gas station book to begin with because if you don't sell books, you can't write books. Uh, so I don't know. The jury's out there. When did you start working? Okay, the question is, when did we start working? Well, I've actually been gathering information for a very long time, but we started writing. Well, we started doing the, the uh, serious research and writing about three years ago. Uh, so we spent about... We spent about a year and a half or two years doing research, and then we spent about a half a year uh, writing, and then we spent all the rest of the time and all of the minutia of things that happen in order for a book to come into print. Back there and then up here. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. The lady in the blue. Oh, people are nodding their head yes. So I'm going to go with yes on that one because <laughs> it was dark when I drove up and I didn't really see it. 
Okay, great, great. Pure oil station, good. So when you go out, take a look at it and compare it to that pure oil design we've seen. Sure. Well, I think they're increasingly tourist attractions. Uh, the the one, I think uh, there's a particular niche that finds these very appealing, and it's the collectors of vintage cars, classic car collectors. You know, they go on road rallies and they go around to destinations, and one of their favorite destinations are old gas stations that are still pretty intact and look good. They like to take pictures of their cars in front of the stations, and. Uh, I, I know from talking to Lauren Nelson, who owns the station in Independence, that he gets quite a lot of traffic now of people that have seen the documentary or read the book who come all the way specifically just to that gas station uh, to, to visit it. So there's certainly a tourist niche out there. Uh, he told, I saw him about three weeks ago, and he told me that uh, that day uh, two guys had driven all the way up from Madison to uh, his station just to take pictures of the car there, and that's uh, about uh, three and a half hours from Madison, so it's no short little trip. So yeah, I think there definitely is a tourist appeal. And there's a wide variety of people who are interested in gas stations. There's the classic car collectors, there are people who collect gas station memorabilia, there are the people who are nostalgic about them because their families owned them uh, in the past or they worked there. Uh, I knew that the gas stations were a hot topic when I started talking about them before the book came out. I started giving talks about gas stations, and I had guys show up to the talks wearing their gas station belt buckles and their hats and stuff from when they worked at gas stations as teenagers or, or young men. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, uh, I'll be signing books which are for sale in the back there, so... Uh, I uh, appreciate it if you come by and buy a book, and if you don't and you have a story to tell me at the table there, I welcome that too. So thank you very much. I have one more image for you before we go. I want to encourage you all to drive with care. This is an image of a young girl with her, uh, with her toy car in front of a gas station. I found countless images like this. Uh, in uh, doing the image research for the book of kids and their cars in front of the stations. It tells you how much a part of a culture it is. Uh, I even found one with a, a, t a small kid's uh, toy airplane uh, pulling up to a station to gas up. So This one's in Madison. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>